Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. So today's episode, you guys have Sharon Song. She's a digital nomad. She has a portfolio of 30 units, and she shares different ways that she's being able to not just live life on her own terms, but build a beautiful portfolio. Isn't that a dream, Mandy? Uh, that is quite literally living the dream. You know, I, I really, my favorite part about this is, you know, we all kind of have this real estate investing habit, right? And you, you need some way, like a, an engine for cash flow to, to feed that habit. And how creative has Sharon been? To, to make sure that that's happening, right? So she has multiple streams of income. I, I hadn't even thought of a half dozen ways <laughs> yes. that she left it. Welcome back, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show. I am Indressa. And I am Mandy. Hello, Mandy. Oh, <laughs> Liz hi. is still on vacation. So Mandy is taking over. Thanks so much again, Mandy. Oh, so excited to be here. Awesome. In today's episode, I have Sharon Song with us. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So before we get into today's story, so Minty and I, between the interviews, we were talking about some stuff that happens behind the scenes, right? And how we were able to come through from the ashes. So Mandy, let's talk about what did not go right, because I think that's important when we talk about things that did not go right mm -hmm. and the examples and how you're able to come out of it and the lessons that you learned. So other women don't make the same mistakes. Want to share your story? Sure. And in, in a little nutshell, there was a, a deal that I was moving towards that I had never done anything with this guy that I'd met at church and our kids played together. Right. So I wanted to do something small. He was a single family guy. So here I'll, I'll help you buy for cash. I'll be the cash. You'll return it in a few weeks and then we'll go do the bigger deal. Well, anyway, yada, yada, yada. Homeboy who I went to church with stole my $110,000. Like literally cash the checks, six weeks, eight weeks go by. I do a, a title search. He had never bought the property. Oof. So yeah, right. So I, I think it's super important that, you know, after that, like I was embarrassed. I had 300 and some units at the time. And I'm like, I should know better. Like how dumb am I? I had just gone through my divorce and I, you know, all of it, like probably I was clinically depressed, like if I'm being honest, right. But I, I think it's so important you know, to, you know, this is super embarrassing, right? Like it should be super embarrassing, but I'm, I'm someone who gets a chance to talk on a podcast. You people think I know what I'm doing kind of, right? But we all have these things that you're embarrassed of. And if you're not, that's something that could have stopped me. That's something that I could have, you know, put my tail between my legs and never bought another property again. But I'm here to tell you, you can figure out a way to get over things like that. So one thing I do now is a background check on everyone that I'm going to do a deal with or give a huge check to uh, a one quick Google search, I would have seen that this guy was a creep, you know, so do the due diligence on the people you're investing with, because it's a marriage, even though you go to church with them. Yes. I mean, how silly was that? Mandy, but tell, tell everybody what happened after. What did oh. you? <laughs> <laughs> so I knew he had never bought the properties and I was, I was in bed, whatever, like thinking about like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did this. Well, I knew the real estate agent who knew the distressed sellers. So I just went to her and said, Hey, can I have that same deal? $45,000 for each property. I took different liquidity, bought for cash. Those, those two properties that they were worth over a hundred thousand each. I was buying for 45,000 each. So I bought them. So I made back more than 110 and he, you know, I, I, I have things going on in the background to, to try to get the money back. In general. So I'm here to tell you, you can triumph from, from defeat. anything. Yeah. You go girl, you girl. <laughs> so Sharon, thank you so much for being on our show. We are excited to hear more about your story. So let's get, let's get started with what, what made you get started in real estate? What propelled you to choose this industry? 
Yeah. In 2012, I was always like interested. I Like at my job, I know I was like always on Redfin, like looking at properties, looking at properties in different markets because I was from the Bay Area. So, uh, you know, properties were really expensive. So I knew out-of-state investing was something I was particularly interested in. And, you know, fast forward, 2013, I bought my first property. Um, it was like an hour away in California. And then I bought, I started buying out of state actually in 2019 and 2020. So like there were many years where I was kind of scared of investing out of state because I didn't know the markets. But now my husband and I have 33 units right now and mm-hmm. uh, trying to trying to build a portfolio right now. I've also been interested in, you know, building passive income and creating financial freedom. And actually my story was, in 2016, I quit my job and traveled the world for two years while building passive income through online side hustles actually first. So that was what I did first and then kind of went back into real estate again. So I was building passive income on like Etsy, blogging, Amazon. And then I built my personal brand on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok and everything. Got it to close to like a million followers for everything. <laughs> and I teach people how to you know build passive income and improve their finances. Wonderful. <laughs> so I I have the opportunity to teach the Strive Pod for small multis, and many folks who end up buying a small multi to get that scale do it a little further away than in their actual backyard. So one thing that can happen there, and that we talk a lot about in the pod, is that things can go wrong quickly if you don't have your eyes on the property. Tell me a couple actionable things that you do to kind of keep your hands around properties that are afar. Yeah. So I think the boots on the ground team is extremely important. So vetting your property management companies, you know, working with specific agents who can send you uh, deals regularly. It's really important to find the right team uh, to work with since you're not going to be there. There's been properties where I haven't seen them and I purchased them. So as long as you have the right team, you can keep replicating the process. You know, if you can trust that they will look after the property and all that thing, that all that stuff. You know, the PMs are the ones who have the best grasp on like the market rents, the type of you know neighborhoods that are best and stuff like that. So I'm able to ask them the questions and they can help with that. You know, understanding the markets. So, so Sharon, for for folks that are from California or other areas where they they feel that they cannot invest in their backyard and they are looking at upstate investment, right? We hear a lot about okay, the property management company is you know one of the crucial team members that you must have it. Many many women say, okay, what do I do? What do I ask them? How do you? You've been successful in doing this. How do you vet them? What questions do you ask the property management companies or what red flags should be, you know, in our face to say, oh, that's not a good fit? Because it's mm. it's important for us to really understand. We know about vetting them, but many times we don't know what that really means. So break that down for us, please. Yeah. So when I vet PM companies, I usually call like a bunch of different ones. I find possible like referrals from agents or I'm looking online and checking their ratings and stuff like that. So as I'm calling them, I'm asking them like their tenant screening process, eviction processes, their fees, different things like that, where I can kind of gauge like their professionalism too. So I've been, you know, there's ones where when they answer, I can tell they're not as like, oh, I have this process in place for this and this and this. So those are ones I avoid. The ones that aren't really responsive to like when I call and they haven't picked up yet on the first, you know, uh, first call, then I'm like, okay, uh, maybe they're not going to be on call when I'm doing this. So stuff like that, I'm asking also like how many units are they currently managing? So just asking them a series of questions and then like just kind of seeing how they answer. I kind of like just put it on a doc and kind of decide from there based off of what I asked them, essentially. Maybe it's because I just bared my soul, but I'm very interested to know something that went wrong with a PM. Because I I feel like if you're as a woman, I don't want to ask a hard question. (laughs) I've already hired you and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say no now because I already said yes. Right. So what is something that you you either in the interview process or having had to fire a property management firm? What is a hard 
thing you had to do with a PM? So I actually haven't had to have like an issue or haven't had an issue uh, with PMs. I know it could be difficult to kind of let go of someone. Uh, I was just thinking kind of when you were telling your story of something that was, you know, a mistake or something in my journey. Uh, we, this is a different type of story, but we recently bought a property at 65K, really cheap. And we wanted to do it for Airbnb. And we saw that the laws said that you can't have one Airbnb within like 500 feet of another. But we checked the website, looked like this address was fine. Uh, But when we actually called them after we bought it, it looked like someone was already in the process of doing it and they they hadn't updated the website yet. So something like I should have called uh, earlier to do that. But the good thing is like, with that type of property, we had multiple exit strategies. Um, so we could do midterm rental or long-term or even flip it, but we're probably going to keep it because uh, I actually haven't sold the property yet because I just enjoy like holding on to each one um, and enjoy the appreciation benefits. Uh, so yeah, that was just like a mistake I could think of in my journey so far. <laughs> there we go. So you, you guys have a portfolio of 30 units, right? Yeah, 33. So, so so walk us the first property. How did you acquire it? Was it a single family, a multifamily? Walk us through the first deal. Yeah, the first property was a single family property. Story wasn't too crazy because uh, my parents actually had an agent they were working with and they passed on the deal. And my parents asked if I wanted to invest in it. I was like, yes. <laughs> and then I put in my money. Uh, but since I had just like graduated from college, started working at my first full-time job, I asked if my brother could like be in on it 50-50 with me. And then I would pay him back slowly. So over time, I paid him back slowly and then transferred that property fully under my name. But then, uh, yeah, so it was 240000 We put in like 13000 of renovations, converted like a den into like a another bedroom. And then, you know, I hadn't touched real estate in a while because I, I was doing the online side hustle stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my next investment was a fourplex. So I got it at 175K. And now it's like appreciated to maybe 260 or 270K, which is great. And this was like during the pandemic. I think everyone was really scared. Uh, but it ended up being like a booming time, I guess, for for housing prices. And where are the properties located? Yeah. So, well, with our portfolio combined, it's California, Texas, Georgia, and Florida. Well, my first one was in California. The next few were in Texas under my name. And then me and uh, my husband uh, invested in Georgia together for a lot of those properties. He has some in Florida. I don't have any of those in Florida, but we actually um, did combine our portfolios uh, recently for asset protection purposes and stuff like that. Very smart. I I see also in the progression of growing a portfolio because 33 is sizable, right? Mm-hmm. But usually the first one or two acquisitions, you, you have you know savings from whatever side hustle, day job, whatever. But then at some point, you run out of money, right? So, you know, what are some things that you did in the process of of hitting some walls, running out of money or or lending becoming difficult to to get you over the hump to continue to grow? So we've done like a cash out refinance to get more capital out. We've worked with a private money lender. Uh, We've also done like some cross collateralization where we bought a seven unit package one time and cross collateralized with another property we bought like free and clear. So then uh, help finance that whole thing. Basically, uh, finding a small local bank in Georgia was helpful so that it made it uh, easier for these like flexible uh, ways of buying um, flexible terms and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, so these are some of the things, but I would also say that a lot of it was kind of increasing my income too with, with like all these other side hustles that were building me passive income. I had multiple income streams working for me that allowed me to grow the amount of money I had to put it back into real estate. I love that. And I want, we want to focus on, on the side hustles, right? Cause many times we, we put our eggs in one little basket and then we don't have that cash flow come coming through. And you, you have built a, a, a huge following in different social medias. So share with us, what are the side hustles and how did that, it has been helping you to support your real estate investment? Yeah. So when I first started, I 
started with an Etsy shop. Like I was selling digital products on Etsy so that anytime people bought, it would just automatically fulfill those orders. Uh, so you wouldn't have to like hold or ship inventory. And then I like did blogging as well. I even try to sell Kindle books. I did Amazon FBA, uh, where basically you ship products to the Amazon warehouse. And whenever you get sales, the warehouse will like fulfill the orders for you. Merch by Amazon, which is like you can upload uh, designs on custom apparel. And whenever people purchase, they will print and fulfill your orders for you too. So a lot of these are like very hands-off and passive. And what I found was like every one of these income streams work. Um, it's just a matter of like which one you have time for and which one mm. you're more passionate about. Um, so then fast forward, like I started my personal brand and a lot of it, uh, the revenue comes from like sponsorships, like uh, ad revenue, like affiliates, products and stuff, stuff like that. My merch by Amazon and Etsy are still going as well. So like over time, I've been able to build these multiple passive income streams and they all take time to build up, but it works for you um, in the long run. So that's the awesome part about it. I kind of feel like that my whole ethos of investing is, is very similar to yours, right? Like I've got to figure out like an engine for cash flow is what mm -hmm. I call it to feed my habit of real estate investing, which is this perfect piggy bank, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in terms of acquisition, what are you looking at now? What type of a deal has your attention? Yeah, I'm usually looking at properties under like 200K right now. I'm uh, currently investing like in Dallas area. So I actually moved uh, to Dallas in January. Uh, we Airbnb'd out our place in the Bay Area, which makes up for the two mortgages. So I kind of say that's like a little Airbnb house hack um, that lets us reduce our expenses even more. And yeah, I'm looking for ones that could actually potentially work as a short-term rental right now because I'm trying to get into that space a little bit more. And I think the good thing, like I mentioned, is if something doesn't pan out uh, with these cheaper properties, I can still have it cash flow with uh, renting it out long-term or doing a midterm uh, with it. So that's kind of the idea. I'm, tr I'm a little bit more risk averse. So that's why I'm looking at a lower price point and like and making sure it can cash flow and has appreciation potential. And if anything doesn't work out, I still have another strategy to make up for it. And, and looking at the market as it, as it is right now, nobody has a crystal ball. If you do, great for you. But for the majority of population that don't have a crystal ball, I'm curious to know, how are you navigating it and how are you bracing yourself to whatever might happen or might not happen? Yeah. So right now we are holding on to a lot of cash, just kind of in case, kind of watching the market. We did pick up that property at 65K because we thought it wasn't, uh, it's it's not risky. It's a cheap kind of project. And we also like it for content purposes. So I like documenting the journeys because mm -hmm. people want to see what's going on. So it was also a lot for that, <laughs> that reason. But we are holding on to a lot, especially because we did that cash out refinance and got like 230K back or something from this moldy house, which uh, I talked about. Yeah, it was like this whole journey that people have seen a lot of the content for where, where it was like completely moldy inside, bought it for 120K. Now it's worth maybe over 350K, but we got it uh, um, essentially at 330k for the cash out refinance. Um, so we were able to pull out about like 230 or so. And that allows us to kind of hold on to some more cash and just kind of watch the market, see if there's bigger dips and and then we'll probably invest more. We actually looked at a property recently that was it was pretty crazy. It was um owned by a, I guess, a drug dealer who got went to prison for 54 years or something. Yeah. Oh, there and, we go. Yeah. <laughs> and he had, I guess, uh, he was selling like meth and stuff like that. So, um, <laughs> so when I walked the property, I was kind of scared. I was like, is this going to be a health hazard and stuff like that? Um, so yeah, we're still looking at properties, but we're not like being super <laughs> impulsive mm -hmm. and buying because we know there might be bigger dips. Um, but we're, we're, we enjoy looking at distressed properties and seeing like if we can fix it up and, um, get it at a higher value, get it up to a higher value. Awesome. And I think that the way that the real estate investors are sharing and building their brand right now has shifted 
especially with TikTok, right? Everything is content, but many times you're just in the middle of stuff and then you forget. It's not yeah. intentional, right? But what you're saying is very intentional. So share with me your, your, your journey regarding building your brand and how that has been helping you grow your portfolio. Yeah, definitely. So um, I, I guess with social media, like I really started my YouTube channel in 2019 and then TikTok on, in 2020. Um, I did have the blog that I started in 2015, but uh, it's just kind of in the background. I think most of my stuff blew up from like the short form videos, actually. So uh, TikTok was really like when things started growing a lot more and then reels came out and then I started repurposing that short form content on Instagram as well. So I feel like a uh, short form video can really build up your personal brand. It's not oversaturated right now. I don't think because of the way the algorithm works, it makes it so that it shows people what they would be interested in versus just like the people that they follow. Um, so if you're you know, if your content has value, it's going to spread. So ultimately, it's not like too saturated where you can't get into it now. Um, it's helped me because like just networking wise, like it's a lot easier now, <laughs> honestly. Um, so people want to talk and stuff like that. That that part makes it easier. And also just like if I wanted to just post something where people could, you know, send me deals or whatever, like I think it would be a lot easier because uh, I haven't done that personally, but like I have a friend who does that regularly and gets incoming deals all the time just from social media. And like, you know, I could reach out and get more, uh, like I, I would be able to raise capital a lot easier too. So if I were to put that energy out there, I probably would be able to do it. So I think those are some of the benefits. And obviously it is like a side hustle too. So like having more income from the side hustle allows me to put it back into real estate. So if someone wanted to build a brand right now, you would uh, put them into short term, short form videos. What are some things, you know, you mentioned that, you know, the value, if you add value, it'll be spreadable. Is this like a hashtag thing? What are, what are the things that I need to know when, when creating short form videos? Yeah. So when people are watching short form video, they're like scrolling really quickly. So you have to get their attention right away and you have to make them stay. So watch time is the most crucial. I would say watch time, then engagement. So like if they're staying to the end of the video, they're probably, it's probably a good video, especially the longer videos that they'll stay all the way to the end for like the three minute ones. That means like it signals to TikTok and these platforms like, oh, this is like a solid one. People want to watch it. So you got to make sure you nail the hook and you got to make sure that um, essentially like any little pauses, like I cut those out because that is a chance that they're going to leave, right? So any chance that they'll leave, like you try to minimize that and try to make sure that they watch it the whole way through. The the biggest, I think, objection people and women that are listening is time, right? There's so many platforms and they have the rehabs going on and building their portfolio and then the list goes on and on. So how do you do with... Um, I don't, with the creating content, do you doing batch? Do you schedule time for it? You go with the flow of the day. What, what are your secrets? Yeah, so I try to batch it. Uh, lately, I have been experiencing some burnout, so I totally understand because it can be hard to keep up with it for so long. Um, but it is easier when you script on one day and you just focus on that. And then like you film on another day. And for, I feel like for girls, you have to put on makeup and all this stuff. So like, yeah, so like for me, I kind of, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to put on makeup this day and then I'll film like multiple videos for that day. So that, that makes it easier because I don't want to put it on every single day. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then I was like, ah, I don't want to yeah. do it. Yeah. You guys take it with my hair as it is. <laughs> with no makeup, I don't care. Do it. <laughs> Uh, I like Andressa. Is this on video? Do I have to? Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, for me, it just makes it easier. And then I, I actually have someone who helps me schedule now a little bit too. So hiring out like anything like you don't have time for is really crucial, I think, for, you know, saving time and like making sure you're focusing on the right thing. So I spent a lot of this year building systems, hiring the right people, you know, and making sure I had like a project management board too. So like using Notion and like having it so that like one, uh, you know, the 
uh, editor knows, okay, these are ready to be uh, edited. And then he can move it to the next one where uh, the other person can schedule that content. So it just makes it a lot easier for me. I'll tell you this who not how concept that this was in at investor con that we just came back from what this was the single most powerful takeaway for me is that mama needs more help in her life. Sharon, I want to follow your example. Give me some ideas for how did you know that this is a thing that I need to hand off? And then how did you find that person to take it over for you? Yeah, I think it comes down to what are the tasks you don't want to do? What are the tasks you are good at and like will move the needle? So I think for me, it's like those are the ones that I didn't want to do. And I knew that if I focused on other tasks, those things would actually grow my business. So I'm trying to have someone work in the business while I work on the business. Mm -hmm. So that way, like I can grow everything while they systemize it and make it a lot easier for me. And in the content space, it's like, I don't want to be editing. I'm doing the stuff that requires me. So that requires like the filming part because I'm in it. So that part requires me, but the editing doesn't require me. So it can be hard because a lot of times you're like, oh, like I have the creative eye, like I won't, I don't want to hand this off. But then like once you do it, you find like a lot of times they can be better than you. <laughs> and then like if you can't even go back after that because you're like, oh, it just like makes my life so much easier. I think that's another piece. It's like, what are the things that really require you to be in and what like really doesn't as well? And like outsourcing those. I love that. And and I also think that you got to put our ego aside or unlearn a lot of stuff that we have learned throughout generations, right? That we need to do it all in order to earn the right to have free time in order to, okay, but if I don't do it, then what? Am, am I going to be called lazy or, uh, well, I need to do it. So to prove to to whom? I don't know. But did you have that b mental battle um, in your head or you were like, this is easy peasy. Take it from me. It's actually, yeah, it was hard because, well, first of all, training's a lot of work. So I'm like, oh, I don't really want to do that. But the easier way is while you're training, you screen record it too. So that, and then you put it in SOP doc. So that like, if anything happens, <laughs> if anything happens, right? Like you can hand that off to someone else a lot easier. So you don't have to do that process again. And it was like a lot of work and a lot of like, you know, I, I can do it better or whatever. But like, if you have other people working for you, then you get a lot more time back. It's like, you only have that the 40 hours or whatever, but if you have multiple people, then you'll have like 80 or 120 or 160. So it's just like, it's like, I knew in the long run that it would be a lot better for my business. So that's why I just like really focused on that. I think SOPs are in dress as love language. Just, <laughs> just so you know. Yeah. Yeah. Just totally so, if it, uh, SOPs and KPIs, like they're. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, how are you finding folks? I, I, I've been on Upwork before. Are, are you putting out ads? What's the best way to find someone to, to fill these needs? Yeah. For me, actually, all of them were through Upwork. If you are looking for someone, um, you know, in a different location, like online jobs, PH is a good one. That's what my husband has used too. But even in your own networks, like we have a summer intern right now working with us, like she's coming in in a few hours. And, uh, you know, that was actually just a friend's daughter. Like he really wanted us to have an internship with her or whatever, so she can learn too. So even in your own circles, if you can find someone, that's a good way as well. Get the help, right? Get the help. I don't think we have excuses now because people can do so many things from whatever they are. I was talking to uh, one of the team members and she's gathering where people are located. And then I came to my head that I actually don't know where everybody that I work with, where they are located. Folks from Australia, I know you guys because we need to schedule the correct time zone, right? But a lot of people, I actually don't know. And it's not that I don't care, but it doesn't matter to the sense that if the job gets done, if the project is moving forward and people are coming to the meetings prepared and ready to go, it really doesn't matter, right? So it's it's a new era, I guess, uh, to, to, to navigate. Sharon, Thank you so much for being on our show. Please share where the ladies can find more information about you. 
Yeah, definitely. So with my social media, you can find me on my full name, Sharon Sung. So that's on my Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. And then you can find my website at digitalnomadquest.com. Awesome. We will put all of those things in our show notes. And now let's transition into our fabulous three questions. Sharon, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> what ready is the or not, here we go. <laughs> drum roll, please. Uh, what is the most transformational book that you've ever read? Well, two books come to mind. I think everyone probably references it, but Four Hour Work Week and Rich Dad Poor Dad were two that like really changed my life because basically. After I had traveled in 2014 for a month, I read those books and that built my whole like passive income financial freedom journey ever since. You are kind of living the four hour work week life <laughs> right now. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, what is your, your most powerful routine to live a financially free and balanced life? Well, I guess like ultimately it's all about uh, increasing your income, reducing your expenses, Income minus expenses, all of that uh, multiplied by investments. So I really live by that. And just like, I'm very, I think, value driven and frugal and stuff like that. So like, I don't spend on the things that like, um, that I don't care about, like material goods don't care. Like, I don't care about that as much versus experiences. Like I care about that more. So I'm okay with spending on that. Um, I'm okay with spending on my business and on uh, real estate and stuff like that. But I don't care as much about like sporting a nice car or like fancy bags and stuff like that. So I guess that's something I live by. Mm, you are my people, Sharon. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right? Which, people, they're like, no makeup yet. We don't yeah. care about the bags and all that. Right. Can just keep that. The real you estate. Can, yes. The chances yeah. for you to find me at a clothing store is very little. <laughs> it's easier to find me at a construction store, picking exactly. up tile, yeah. have more fun with that. Those are my people. <laughs> Love it. Uh, which woman, famous or not, has inspired you the most? I would say my mom. Uh, I'm, I'm sure other people have said that. Um, for me, I think like just my parents, they sacrificed so much for me and like really uh, gave me a lot of that love and attention that and also gave me. Um, like allowed me to be financially savvy because like they passed that down to me too. Mm -hmm. um, they just like taught me a lot and like cared for me a lot. Uh, I'm just really appreciative and um, they're super inspiring. They've done so much. Like they came from um, Hong Kong, China. Mm -hmm. They didn't really have much and they immigrated here all for us. So like, and they've been able to, um, you know, retire and be okay because they worked really hard to uh, get their finances up there. And I think I um, look at that a lot and like bring it into my own life as well. Wonderful. Sharon, we really appreciate you spending your time with us and sharing our experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.